Good evening. Welcome to Christmas Eve service at First Baptist Church. I am not exactly sure how long this has been going on, but I'm going to ask the ladies if they would come up. They're going to open our service with uh, a couple numbers. So all the ladies that are in the group, please come on up. But how many of you came to a Christmas Eve service here at First Baptist Church when you were young? Raise your hand. Younger, okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Ray, do you have any idea when the first one was? Yeah. Yeah, so this has been a, a long tradition here at First Baptist Church, and it's a wonderful tradition. Not all traditions are great, but to celebrate our Savior's uh, coming on Christmas Eve is a wonderful thing to do. All right, I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer, and then our ladies are going to start. Father, thank you for sending your son. Thank you for loving us. Lord, uh, many times when we didn't even love our own selves, thank you for letting Jesus die for us and pay the price for our sins. Lord, would you bless this service, and we pray that everything that's said and done would bring honor and glory to Christ. May it be a sweet-smelling savor, Lord, that comes up to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, ladies. Let's all go ahead and stand together as they make their way back to their places. We're going to start off singing Oh Holy Night tonight. Oh Holy Night. They're going to get that up on the screen for us. Oh Holy Night. The stars are brightly shining. We're going to sing all three verses of this together. Let's sing this together. Oh Holy Night. Okay, we're going to sing it tonight, I promise. Maybe we should sing Silent Night right now. No, I'm just kidding. That's later. Oh, holy night. Let's sing it out together. Ready? Oh, holy night. The stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior. Long lay the world in sin and error pining Till he appeared and the soul felt its worth A thrill of hope The weary world rejoices for Yahweh by the light. Let's sing it together. Or truly he taught us. Ready? Truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Change shall he break for the slave is our brother and in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise. We let all within us praise his holy name. Christ is the Lord. singing tonight. I'm going to actually ask the men who are singing tonight, come on up to the front. We're going to sing it this time, and you may be seated, and we're going to sing a song tonight entitled, I Call Him Lord.
ahead and just, you can stay seated. We're going to sing another carol, O Come All Ye Faithful. Then right after this, we're going to have another singer come on up and sing another special tonight. Carol Schaefer will come up right after this. But we're going to sing, O Come All Ye Faithful. It's in your hymn book, in hymn 130, if you need it in your hymn book. Let's sing it out together tonight. Oh, come all ye faithful. Woo. Let's start that over from the beginning. <laughs> Sorry. Let's sing it at the beginning together. Ready? Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come. Sing choirs of angels. Sing choirs of angels. Sing in exaltation. Oh, sing all ye bright hosts of heaven above. Glory to God all. Glory. Carol's going to come and sing another song tonight. In the little village of Bethlehem, there lay a child one day, and the sky was bright with a holy light for the place where Jesus lay. Hallelujah. sang hallelujah how it rang and the sky was bright with a holy light twas the birthday of a king was a humble birthplace, but oh, how much God gave to us that day. From the manger bed, what a path was led, what a perfect holy way. Hallelujah. How the angels sang, hallelujah, how it rang, and the sky was bright with a holy light, t'was a 
birthday of our King. Okay, now we're going to sing a Christmas carol. I don't know how many of you have hear, heard this regularly. This is one um, I've... I discovered it kind of when I moved here. I didn't discover it, but I, I refound it, I guess you could say, um, in my own life. <laughs> and it's one you don't really think of that much when you think of Christmas carols, but if, this, is, this is one of my new favorites. So we're going to sing this together, uh, hymn 123, if you need it in your hymn book. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. And just listen to the lyrics, and I'll explain it right after we get done singing it to you, who wrote it and why they wrote it. Let's sing it together. Ready? I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, good will to men. I thought how as the day had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, good will to men. And in despair I bowed my head, there is no peace on earth, I said, and fate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth good will to men on that next one then pealed the bells ready then pealed the bells more loud and deep god is not dead nor doth he sleep hell wrong shall fail the right prevail with peace on earth to men. Let me explain to you about this song just real quick, why I love it. I love that last verse, of course, but the author of it is a guy named Henry Longfellow, and he lived during probably the most divided time in our nation's history in the 1800s and during the Civil War. And in about late 1850s, in about 1858, 1859, his wife passed away in a very tragic accident. And uh, through it all, he became a very bitter man. Uh, and it was around Christmas time. And every time Christmas rolled around, he just wept. And he hated the songs of Christmas because it reminded him of his wife passing away. And then a few years later, uh, of course, the Civil War begins. And he lives up in the northern part of the country. And uh, his son wants to volunteer for service in Massachusetts. And he didn't want his son to go, but he had to let his son go off and fight in the war. And during this time, uh, his son gets wounded on the battlefield, and he comes home, and he's recovering at home, and it's hit and miss if he's going to make it. And his son is who reminded him that there is hope in the Lord and that there is peace on this earth. And they're living in a time when a nation's literally divided against itself. And yet the hope of Christmas and the Christmas bells reminded them of the hope that Jesus Christ came. And that there's still hope on this earth. And so that last verse we just sing, then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. With peace on earth, goodwill to men. That's why it's one of my favorite Christmas carols. And uh, I, I have a video I'll show some of you one day uh, about that story, but it's a very interesting story of how that song was written. Let's all stand together tonight, right before the message. We're going to sing together Silent Night, Holy Night. Uh, this is a Christmas favorite, Silent Night. Let's sing this together. All is calm, all is bright. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin mother and child. 
child, holy infant so tender and mild, sleep in heavenly peace, sleep in heavenly peace. Silent night, holy night, Son of God, love's pure light, radiant beams from thy holy face, with the dawn. Lord, at thy birth, Jesus. Men in the back, if you could get that verse started over, the one we just sang, and pianos, you're going to get us started, then you're going to drop out, and we're going to sing an acapella together. Ready? On that last verse. Ready? Silent night, holy night. All right, you may be seated. So wonderful to have you here tonight. And we don't take for granted these Christmas Eve services. They're a great blessing. And as Ray mentioned, as far back as his boyhood, he remembers them. Uh, there's a couple that are not with us tonight. Um, Maisel Wilson went home to be with the Lord early Sunday morning, and Maisel was here for an awful lot of these Christmas Eve services. Mary Shafaley is in the nursing home and trying to recover, and so pray for Mary. And uh, it's wonderful that we can gather together, but let's not take it for granted. I want to speak tonight on the subject, the shepherds who lost their job at Christmas the shepherds that lost their job at Christmas. If you'd like to follow along with me, I'm going to read Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 8, and read through verse 18. Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch o'er their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph, and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. Let's look to the Lord. Father, please use this message and remind us of what a privilege it is to know your Son is our Savior. 
thank you for allowing him to come. Lord, we could never thank him enough for being willing to be the Lamb of God that laid down his life and shed his blood for us. Thank you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Getting laid off from your job is a bad thing, but it's even worse to lose your job around Christmas time. That's not a problem today. Today we have more jobs than we have people that are willing to work, but these shepherds lost their job. I remember growing up, there was a country singer by the name of Merle Haggard that sang a song, If We Make It Through December, the same theme. If we can just get through December, everything will be all right. Again, there's no worse time to lose your job than at Christmas, and I wonder if you're familiar with this Christmas story in Luke, and we find a group of shepherds who lost their job at Christmas. Actually, they lost their job because of Christmas. We're familiar with the story of the shepherds in the Christmas story. We sing about them in our Christmas songs. We see their images on Christmas cards and Our children dress up in shepherd's robe uh, for our Christmas plays. The Christmas night was a glorious night, but it was a night that caused these shepherds to lose their job. Let me explain what I'm saying. First of all, I want you to notice the occupation that was assigned. In verse 8, it says, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. The occupation of a shepherd is often found in the Bible. The Bible mentions shepherds or shepherding over 200 times in the scriptures. The first shepherd that we find in the Bible is Abel, the brother of Cain. Famous shepherds in the Bible, Abraham, Jacob, Moses, uh, David, all of these men were shepherds. Some of the greatest names in Jewish history were shepherds. However... By the time that Jesus was born, the role of the shepherd was scorned and despised by the successful people of the day. A shepherd was viewed as a simple, unlearned man and shepherding a lowly occupation. Understand how shepherds were viewed makes it all the more interesting that when God announced that his son had been born, he came to shepherd. He told them first. No more glorious announcement was ever made to any group of people, and it was first made to a group of shepherds. Ever since that night, philosophers and theologians have come and found in the birth of Christ a theme for lifelong study. It's a truth that exercises the wisest faculties of universities. Kings and wealthy have come and bring their tangible and material offerings of incense, myrrh, temples made of marble, altars made of alabaster. The arts have come to this simple stable with painting and music and sculpture to lay at the feet of the newborn babe the best beauty that the world could ever produce. Yet the first feet to find their way to Bethlehem, to enter into that humble stable, to hear of this birth were a group of shepherds, poor men with nothing to bring, simple and unlearned men with no official raiment to trail behind them. Why was this great and glorious announcement made to a group of shepherds which kept watch over their flock by night? I believe it was because uh, this was not an ordinary group of shepherds. Now let me explain what I'm going to say. First of all, I want you to notice the significance of these shepherds. These shepherds watched sheep just outside of Bethlehem. Bethlehem is just a short distance from Jerusalem. Matter of fact, when you're in Jerusalem, you can look down and see where Bethlehem is. In the Jewish temple, morning and evening, a lamb was offered as a sacrifice. Please bear in mind that not just any lamb could be offered. 
The lambs were offered as a sacrifice, had to be without spot and blemish. The law of God was plain. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 21. And if there be any blemish therein, as if it be lame or blind, or have any ill blemish, thou shalt not sacrifice it unto the Lord thy God. Listen also to Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 1. Thou shalt not sacrifice unto the Lord thy God any bullock or sheep wherein is blemish or any ill-favoredness, for that is an abomination unto the Lord your God. The word blemish speaks of something that's stained or spotted. The lambs that were offered could not be sick, they could not be lame, they could not be blind, they could not be deformed in any way. There could be no sore, no scab, no scratch, no scar on the lambs, or it would disqualify them uh, from being a sacrifice. The law repeatedly stated that the sacrifices, the lambs that would be used for sacrifice in the temple had to be without blemish. And in order to supply an unblemished lambs for the daily offerings, the temple authorities had their own private flocks. Does anybody want to guess where those flocks were held? They were held in Bethlehem, just outside of Jerusalem. The sheep that were being watched over by those shepherd that night, I believe, were these sheep that were owned by the temple authorities to provide perfect, unblemished lambs. Now, understanding this, we see that these ship shepherds were not raising these sheep to shear, are to sell for their wool for profit, or these sheep were not being fattened to be butchered to fill hungry stomachs. These sheep that would be offered as sacrifices, and these shepherds were the shepherds that were assigned the role of watching over this special flock of sheep. That's the significance of these shepherds. Secondly, I want you to see the symbolism of the sheep. As we've already seen, these were no ordinary shepherds and these were no ordinary sheep. These were sheep that were set apart to die as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of men. Now, every day, morning and evening, the temple authorities would offer innocent animals. Their blood would be shed and those animals would be burned upon the altar. Now, individuals could bring lambs, but there were morning and evening sacrifices every day. You see, these sh sheep had to be so perfect because they typified a lamb one day that would come, the Lamb of God. That's why it was so important that they were to be checked. The qualifications of the sacrifice official lamb indicated that the sacrifice for sin required an innocent one. An innocent one would die for a guilty one. When individuals would bring a lamb to one of the priests, they would put their hands on the head of that innocent lamb, symbolizing that they were laying their sins on the head of that innocent substitute. Can you imagine, can you imagine how difficult that must have been for people? Can you imagine as they look down into the face of that little innocent lamb, realizing that in just a short few moments, that lamb would die and would die for their sins. That was, that had to be a powerful experience. Listen what Peter said. He said in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, For as much as ye you know you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Our Savior, the Lord Jesus, was holy and spotless. Uh, there was no guile or sin to be found in him. He was the spotless Lamb of God uh, without blemish that would die for all of our sins. W.D. Davies in his book, Paul and Rabbinic Judaism, says this, uh, 
in the temple at Jerusalem, every year there were sacrificed 1,093 lambs, 113 bulls, 37 rams, 32 goats. Now these were the official sacrifices. These were the sacrifices that the priests would make. These were not the free will offerings or the sin offerings or the trespass offerings that individuals would bring. Those were added on top of these. Every one of those thousand lambs were offered through time and pointed to one lamb, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Then one night in a manger in the little town of Bethlehem, a lamb was born. The world thought it was uh, the news of the century uh, when they cloned a lamb and named her Dolly. But I have news for you. The Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Lamb of God, was born in Bethlehem. And that was real news. Later, there was a scene at the banks of the Jordan River. The crowd was spellbound. The preacher was rough. His dress uh, uh, was rough. His manner was was rough. His diet was rough. He was known as John Baptist. And he preached to Israel, repent uh, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And people were spellbound. But one day as he was preaching and the crowds were standing uh, along the side of the Jordan River, uh, he looked up and he saw one coming and he said, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. He had told them previously, Indeed, I baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. And now John introduced him. He was Jesus of Nazareth. He didn't come from a special place. Matter of fact, one of his own disciples years later would ask the question, can any good thing come from Nazareth? Well, something good did come, the Lamb of God. On those Judean hillside that first Christmas night, you find a group of shepherds that were watching o'er their flocks, the flocks of the temple. Those special lambs that had met the criteria to be offered as a sacrifice in the temple. They were responsible for watching over these sacrificial lambs. Is it any wonder that the angel of the Lord came to them? All of those little lambs they watched over was pointing to one lamb, and they were about to be introduced to him. There's a second thought I want you to see tonight. The occupation that was abandoned. To these shepherds, it was just another night of watching over their flocks. Then suddenly, the night turned into an amazing event. An event that would be celebrated through the ages. Little did they realize that night when they bedded their flocks down, their life as well as the lives of countless millions through the ages would be changed. Indeed, it was a night to be remembered. It happened with dramatic swiftness. I'm sure that it was like any other night. The flocks were settling down. The shepherds were getting comfortable. Some of them uh, were on one side of the flock. Some were on the other. And they were ready to rest for the night. But the first thing that happened was a glorious appearing. In verse 9 of our text, we read, And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord, sh uh, Lord shone round about them, and they were afraid. Without warning, without expectation, the angel of the Lord appeared, and as he appeared, a glorious brightness, a heavenly brightness of the glory of the Lord shone around about them. A manifestation of God's presence and power flashed around them. Sometimes in Wyoming, if you get away from town, it gets awful dark. You look up at the night sky, and if it's cloudy, you can't see any stars. But it went from the darkest of night to the brightness that these men had never experienced. 
There's no wonder that they weren't afraid. They had never seen anything like that before. If it had been us, we'd have been scared out of our wits too. It was a sight unexpected, a sight unbelievable. It was a sight that was inconceivable. Yet it happened to them, and for centuries, men had been waiting for the Messiah to show up. The Old Testament prophets had prophesied that he would come. Isaiah said he would be born of a virgin. Uh, the psalmist David said that his hands and would be pierced. And all of these prophets for, uh, for hundreds of years had foretold his coming. People were watching. They were waiting. And yet now it happened. Yet now the angel of the Lord with all the glory of God shining around him announced that Jesus was born. And that brings me to my second thought, a glorious announcement. We read in Verses 10 through 12, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. It was an announcement that calmed their fears. It was an announcement that brought great joy. The Savior had been born. Now take note of the word born for just a moment. In the original language, the word stands very close to the beginning of the sentence. Because born unto you. In the Greek language, the closer you are to the beginning of the sentence, the importance of the word increases. And this is at the very beginning of the sentence. Why? Because this birth was so important. Long ago promised, men waiting years, decades, centuries for it to happen. Now, finally, he had been born. Now, let me give you the new house understanding of what the angel of the Lord said to the shepherds. He said, fellas, you know the one that Abel was thinking about when he offered a lamb on the alt altar? Fellas, you know the one that Abraham had in mind when he said to Isaac, My son, God will provide himself a lamb. Fellas, you know the one that the Israelites down in Egypt, when they sprinkled blood on the doorposts and the lintel of their house, the one they were thinking about, the one that Aaron and his sons were thinking about every time they offered a sacrifice. The one, fellows, that your sheep foreshadow. Fellows, I want you to know something. He's here. He's here. And then thirdly, a glorious anthem. In verses 13 and 14 of our text. And suddenly there was with the angel a, mul a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. In those days in the land of Palestine, the birth of a boy was the occasion of great joy. When the time of the birth was near at hand, friends and local musicians would gather near the house. And when the birth was announced, and if it was a boy, the musicians broke into song and music. There were congratulations and rejoicing. The ladies, I hate to tell you this, but if it was a girl, the musicians went silently home. Now, I must admit I don't agree with the custom, being the father of two daughters. Yet that's the way it was. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Mary and Joseph were far from their home. So instead, God gave his own celebration. God sent his own musicians and singers to announce and welcome the birth of his son. Now, how did these shepherds respond to all that happened? We read in verse 15, And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even to Bethlehem and see the things which has come to pass, 
which the Lord hath made known unto us. The shepherds had the responsibility of tending their flocks. And their flocks weren't just any flocks. They were the flocks of the temple. They were the flocks of the sheep that would be offered as sacrifices. But you know what they did? They left those temple lambs. If you will, they left their occupation. But we see them forgetting all about their job and all about the flocks and taking off to Bethlehem. We see them abandoning their occupation. Lastly, notice with me, not only the occupation that was assigned and abandoned, but notice lastly, the occupation that was assumed. In verse 16, our Bible text tells us, And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. I don't know if you ever think about these passages, but I do. I kind of think about it. I, I wonder how many stables did they have to go to? How many, how many places did they have to check before they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger? Now, lying in a manger was not the normal crib of a baby. But you see, Bethlehem was full of people. All the descendants of David were there. Why? Because Caesar wanted to get an enrollment. He wanted tax money. Governments haven't changed in 2,000 years. But the shepherds found him. Just as the angel said, he was lying in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes. Now imagine the scene with me tonight. The stable stunk like all stables stink. There was the stench of urine, dung, hay, uh, sheep reeked pungently in the air. The ground was cold and hard and cobwebs clung to the rafter of that little stable. A lowlier place of birth could not have been found. But I doubt that the smell of the place held much interest to the shepherds. They were captivated by the child lying in a manger. Why? The Savior they saw. Verse 17, And when they had seen it, it? It was the scenario that the angels had described. He said, You're going to find the Messiah. You're going to find the Savior and he's going to be lying in a manger. Now, that's not where you normally find a baby. And when they saw that, they understood that this was the baby that had been described to them by the angels. I can imagine the shepherds walking into the stable, and their eyes were first drawn to the young mother uh, looking down upon the face of her baby in her arms. They stand in silence, yea, uh, in awe, looking at this newborn babe. They had just been told by the angel of the Lord that this was the promised one. And I'm sure as they looked at him, they were amazed. So this is him. He is a baby. His face is prunish and red, yet his cry is strong and healthy, but still... He's a helpless little one, a piercing cry of a newborn. He suckles the breast of his young mother and he squirms in her arms, his little hands and feet peeking forth out of swaddling cloth with which he's wrapped. Yet what they are observing, his majesty in the midst of the mundane, this holiness Surrounded by the filth of sheep manure. This divinity in a stable. This baby that had created worlds. This baby that overlooked the universe and held everything together. This baby wrapped in uh, swaddling clothes had worn the garments of glory throughout the universe. This baby had occupied the throne of heaven. This baby was the Savior. This was the Lamb of God. This was Messiah. In verse 17, And when they had seen him, 
they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. Not only the Savior they saw, but notice the Savior they share. The amazing thing about witnesses is that witnesses have to see something. You know what? If you go into a court, you can't say, well, Joe told me he saw. You know what will happen? The other attorney will say, I object, Your Honor, that is hearsay. Please strike the record. And the judge will say, uh, the recorder, please strike those comments. We're not going to listen to those. You know what a witness has to do? A witness has to tell you what they saw. They have to. You see, these shepherds had a first-hand account of what had just transpired. Allow me to use my imagination for a moment. Now, I don't know how many shepherds there were, but let's just say tonight, for sake of argument, there were two. And let's call them Joe and Pete. Those are good Jewish names. I can hear Joe say, Pete, you know who we're looking at? We're looking at God, Pete. That's the promised Messiah. This is the Savior of the world. I can hear Pete say to Joe, I know. Pete pauses as he gazes intently at this little baby sleeping so content within Mary's arms and then says, Joe, you know what this means? You know what it means, don't you, Joe? Joe looks at him with eyes as big as a saucer and he nods his head. Yes, this means we no longer have a job. We no longer need to have little lambs dying representing this one lamb. This is the Lamb of God that will take away the sins of the world. Praise God, Pete and Joe lost their job. No more sacrificial lambs needed. No more offerings had to be made. The Lamb of God had come to be offered as an eternal sacrifice for your sins and my sins. The shepherds lost their job that night, but they gained another. They became evangels of good news. They left telling everybody what they had seen. Everywhere they went, there was the story of the night outside of Bethlehem when they had been tending their flocks and the heavenly host uh, came upon them and told them of this amazing event that had just transpired. We too have seen the Christ child. I asked Caleb to put on the sign this week, the, ma the babe in the manger came to die as the Christ on the cross. The story doesn't end at Christmas. Thirty-three and a half years later, Jesus Christ laid down his life. He said, no man takes my life. I lay it down. And if I lay it down, I have the power to take it up again. You see, he was God manifest. During this Christmas season, we often... Let our minds be filled with thoughts of gifts to buy and meals to prepare and parties to attend and all the normal things associated with the season. But tonight, I hope for just a few moments, you'll remember that many years ago, on this night, God sent forth His Son, born of a virgin, to be the Lamb of God. The real meaning and message of Christ, Christmas is that God's Lamb came, came to take away the sins of the world. And when He did come, He caused the shepherds to lose their job. And I don't think they minded a bit. I think they realized they had a greater job. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. I thank you for coming out to our Christmas Eve service. I want to ask Pastor Caleb if he would come and let's stand together tonight. If you don't know about the Lamb of God that died for you, I'm available. Pastor Caleb's available. Pastor Carl's available. Pastor Harvey's available.
the deacons of our church are available to tell you why Jesus died on that cross and how you can have the hope of eternal life. We're here to help you. That's the meaning of Christmas. God loved you enough that he sent his son into this world to die for you and me and pay our sin debt. And I don't know about you, but that would, that would make an Episcopalian shout. Glory to God. I don't have to bear my sins anymore. Praise his name. Jesus paid my sin debt. Pastor Caleb, let's end with singing a, a Merry Christmas to uh, we wish you a Merry Christmas. We all know this. Sing it out together and uh, have a little bit of a different twist. So watch the words on the screen and sing it together. Ready? We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Glad tidings we bring to you from our King. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Great singing tonight. Thank you for coming to our Christmas Eve service. We're going to go ahead and close in prayer. Then you are dismissed. Enjoy Christmas with your families. Tomorrow morning, we are having our Christmas uh, morning service just at 11 a.m. There's no Sunday school, no evening service uh, for our church folks who come here. And uh, this next week, we're going to have Maisel's uh, funeral service here. It's Thursday, December 29th at 11 a.m. here at the church. At the church. So if you're going to come to that, 11 a.m. this Thursday and also our Christmas Day service. Merry Christmas again. Let's close in prayer and we'll be dismissed. Generally, Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the message that Pastor brought tonight. Lord, I'm sure those shepherds uh, might have been worried about losing their job. But, Lord, Lord, they lost it for the greatest gift ever. Lord, the ultimate sacrifice of your son and Jesus coming onto this earth. Thank you for the salvation we can have in knowing him as our savior. Lord, thank you for the wonderful hope that he is still risen and that he's coming again very soon. And Lord, that he's going to bring peace to this earth, bring peace to everything, Lord. And we lift these things up to you. Lord, help us to get home safe tonight. And Lord, we ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen.